WFLA now will begin momentarily. WFLA now will begin momentarily. Live on WFLA now, this is Hey JB. Here's JB Duno. Brian Laundrie's parents filed to limit their depositions in the lawsuit against them filed by Gabby Petito's parents, alleging they were aware of Gabby's murder and did nothing to help. We're live on WFLA Now from the Stream Center. We do have a feed just coming in moments ago of this morning's pre-trial hearing from Venice, Florida. Good morning to you folks. JB here with you live across all platforms here on WFLA Now. Let's go live to the courtroom feed. Things haven't really got underway, but just want to show you inside the courtroom where we are expected to hear from Judge Hunter W. Carroll, in addition to attorneys for both sides. Actually, the attorneys have just now filed into the courtroom. In the back there, you can see that is attorney Matthew Luca, the Florida attorney representing Chris and Roberta Laundry. On the left, you can see attorney Pat Riley, who is representing the plaintiffs in this case, that being Joe Petito, Gabby Petito's father, Nicole Schmidt, Gabby Petito's mother. They are awaiting a hearing that is currently ongoing in this courtroom to wrap up and resume. Uh, I believe that that is taking place virtually and at, at 11.15 Eastern time, so nine minutes from now, this hearing, of course, will get underway. So we're here live across all platforms to bring you this hearing, but also to let you know exactly what this hearing is about. Last month in October, uh, Matthew Luca, on behalf of his clients, Chris and Roberta Laundry, they filed uh, to limit the scope of the depositions in the civil lawsuit put forth by Gabby Petito's parents that is expected to advance to a jury trial in August of 2023, so that being next year. The depositions, of course, a very important part of the process as they will get to ask questions, of course, talking about uh, Pat Riley, uh, the attorney for Gabby Petito's parents, uh, we'll get to ask questions uh, to Chris and Roberta Laundry pertaining to the subject matter of the lawsuit, which is the allegation that Chris and, Roberta Laundry, Chris and Roberta Laundry were aware that Gabby was murdered because Brian told them, but didn't do anything but release a single uh, statement that was put forth in September of last year. So what they have done is filed a motion to limit the scope of that deposition. Uh, and limit the scope to a certain time frame that we're going to go over here. The time frame being between August 27th of 2021, the day Petito is believed to have been killed, and September 19th, the day that her remains were discovered. So the only questions that could be asked during the deposition process are pertaining to that time frame. Also as well, and I have it here in my hand, this is the motion put forth by Chris and Roberta Laundry. It also says defendants seek a protective order from the court prohibiting the plaintiffs from inquiring into irrelevant matters during their depositions in order to protect them from annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, undue burden, and expense. As the court is aware, this case arises out of the undeniably sad circumstance where the defendant's son, Brian Laundry, killed the plaintiff's daughter, Gabby Petito, after which the defendant's son committed suicide. This has been a truly heartbreaking experience for both families. The public who followed the case and the plaintiffs are likely curious about Brian Laundrie's life, his last days, his interaction with his parents, and the thoughts and feelings experienced by his parents. But curiosity is not a reason to require the defendants to discuss such personal and heart-wrenching details. Rather, the discovery must be relevant to the cause of action at issue. So the lawsuit is for intentional infliction of emotional distress 
And of course, what they are trying to do is limit the scope of the deposition, limit the scope of the questions that can be asked to Chris and Roberta Laundry. We should also point out over the, um, and of course, our, I'm sure that there are legal experts that are joining us in the comment section that can speak to more of this in our comment section, but um, the laundries have the opportunity to uh, to file, uh, of course, or to, excuse me, the laundries have the opportunity to seek their Fifth Amendment rights and remain silent through the course of the depositions. That is an option that they have to not answer questions and to remain silent. I asked Steve Bertolino uh, a question, that question this morning. He said, quote, why don't we leave that question until after today's hearing and the judge makes his decision? Have a wonderful day. So we will, of course, ask that question to Steve Bertolino. That is the uh, attorney from Long Island in uh, in New York, who has been the longtime attorney representing Chris and Roberta Laundry, uh, and we will, uh, of course, hopefully in time, find out whether or not th the depositions are going to occur. It's just a matter of whether or not they are going to be limited. And a ruling is expected today, according to Pat Riley, who is in this courtroom uh, on the while well, he's off to the left side of your screen. Uh, Pat Riley expects Judge Hunter W. Carroll to come to a decision today as to whether or not the request for limitations on the deposition will be granted or will be denied. This is expected to be a very uh, brief uh, hearing, pretrial hearing, in relation to the one that we brought you this summer, the one over the summer that you might remember. This was it uh, in June when, of course, there was the seek to d the the um, the request to dismiss uh, the lawsuit uh, put forth by Nicole Schmidt and and Joe Petito, and that uh, that request was denied, paving the way for this to advance to a jury trial uh, in August of 2023. This was a a much longer hearing, uh, roughly about an hour. Uh, this hearing that we're about to have is about 15 minutes long. We now see Pat Riley and Matthew Luca. Uh, taking their seats. Gabby Petito's parents, Brian Laundrie's parents, not expected to be in attendance today. That's what I was told. No no surprise, really, as far as Chris and Roberta Laundry. Uh, we weren't sure whether or not Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt were going to be present for this particular hearing. Again, much smaller than the one in June. Pat Riley told me that they will not be here in person, nor will they be present virtually. There is a Zoom component to this hearing as well. For the first time, um, let's bring up actually our audio is up so we don't have audio coming through on the feed at this moment uh, I'm sure that the courtroom will turn on the feed as soon as we have audio uh, in relation to the pre-trial hearing so we're live on WFLA now across all platforms and what we are going to do of course is after this 15 to 20 minute hearing we are going to stay here with you live break down exactly uh, what we have learned, what has transpired, uh, what the ruling is from the judge. And then also, too, we are going to take you outside the courthouse and give the opportunity to Pat Riley and Matthew Luca to speak to our cameras and give their reaction. We see a, a moment of um, two attorneys here just talking before the actual hearing gets underway. Matthew Luca patting Pat Riley there on the back for a moment. And so this is a, a legal battle that is brewing between the parents of Brian Laundrie and the parents of Gabby Petito. And this is all these many months between now and August of 2023 when this trial is going to begin or scheduled to begin spent preparing for what will be a very contentious lawsuit and jury trial. The Laundries, of course, as many of you know, have remained uh, mostly silent. And I say mostly only because that they have, uh, of course, issued a statement going back to September of last year. They have been extraordinarily uh, quiet at the advice of their attorney, Stephen Bertolino. While, of course, we have heard multiple times, including on this live stream in an interview with Gabby Petito's parents, Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito. So on the left side of your screen, again, to just get our audience familiar with these two faces because we will be seeing a lot of them in August of 2023. These are the Florida attorneys uh, representing the, suit, the two sides of this case, the plaintiffs being represented uh, on the left, Pat Riley representing Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito, Matthew Luca on the right representing 
Chris and Roberta Laundry. I would bring up the audio if I had it. There is no audio from inside the courtroom at this time. They will turn on audio when Judge Hunter W. Carroll enters the courtroom and we get underway in approximately two minutes from now. Again, as a reminder, we will be paying attention to your comments across all social media platforms. Uh, we will be featuring some of your hashtag HeyJB questions and comments after the live stream, or excuse me, the live stream of the court proceeding is, is, is a wrap. So we'll be paying attention to your comments here over the course of the next 15 or so minutes. Again, the 15 minute time allotted for this trial as we're getting in some of the audio here for the first time. Let's go over just really quickly, if we may, why, again, this is important. Uh, this is important because if the judge rules uh, for this protective order, there will be limitations placed. And we'll go over this more after the live, after the actual hearing is, is done because of the dates. I want to really hone in on these dates and why they're important. But if, he, if Judge Hunter W. Carroll rules in favor of this motion... Uh, there will be limitations as to the questions that can be asked to Chris and Roberta Laundry. Now, again, there's no we have no guarantee that they're going to speak in the deposition process because they could invoke their Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. But if if it's granted and they do decide to speak, then there will be limitations. If the judge rules against the Laundry's order, that will be two for two on that. By the way, because of course their their motion to seek dismissal in June was denied. Um, then that will mean that pretty much everything, for the most part, everything is on the table as far as questions being asked uh, to Chris and Roberta Laundry as it pertains to the lawsuit that has been filed on behalf of Gabby Petito's parents for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Let's go back live and show you from inside the courtroom. And we're listening in on audio from the courtroom feed, saying hello to our YouTube live moderators saying hello and thank you for all that you do. And we will again be featuring your questions and your comments here momentarily. A bit of a jovial moment between the two sides as they are awaiting Judge Hunter W. Carroll. On Judge Carroll's calendar, this is a hearing that is scheduled for 15 minutes. As you can see there, Pat Riley checking his watch to make sure that we are about to start. The time now is 11.16. And they are taking their seats. And we will listen in. I have audio up on full blast. So when they do turn on audio, I'll be able to hear it. You will be able to hear it. Okay, Entering it. Judge Hunter W. Carroll. Miss Potts, Sue Potts. Potts, 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 Potts. Okay, you, sorry, you you were reverbing. I'm the court reporter. Okay, and what company are you with today? U.S. Legal. This is case number 2022-CA1128. Uh, Joseph Petito, Nicole Schmidt versus Christopher Laundry, Roberta Laundry. If we could have the attorneys please uh, make their appearance. Good morning, Your Honor. Patrick Riley for Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt. Good morning, Your Honor. Matt Luke on behalf of Chris and Roberta Laundry. And uh, Mr. Luke, we're here on your motion for protective order, which is at document identification number or DIN 51. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. You may proceed. Your Honor, would you uh, uh, prefer that I? Speak from the podium, or I don't care. Matter. Whatever makes you feel most comfortable. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so, Your Honor, obviously you're very familiar with this case, so I'm not going to go through through the the history of it. Um, we filed this motion for protective order. We have the uh, the depositions for the laundry scheduled um, coming up, and um, the purpose of our protective order 
is that we want to limit the scope of those depositions. Now, we're not asking the court to preclude those depositions entirely, which was the focus of the cases cited by uh, the plaintiff in their response. And frankly, most of the cases in this area relate to uh, completely precluding depositions. Rather, we want to focus the depositions on the rele relevant period of time identified in the amended complaint. The attorney statement, uh, which is the core of the cause of action in this case, uh, the intent of that statement, the knowledge of the laundries during the period of time of that statement, and any actions they took uh, during that time, of course, subject to the attorney-client privilege or any other applicable privileges. Now, the plaintiffs in their response state that they want to inquire into the relationships between Brian and Gabby, between Brian and his parents, between Brian's parents and Gabby, and between the... Well, let me ask you this, because ultimately, if I were to grant your motion, I'm going to have to write an order that lays out the contours. So what date range are you talking about? So, Your Honor, I believe in, in the complaint, uh, the, the plaintiffs alleged that on August 27th that Brian notified his parents about what happened. Now, un understandably, at, when we have the deposition, that may or may not be the specific date, but certainly we're, we're fine with, from the period of time when Brian first notified his parents that something happened, at least. So um, under your proposed limitation, any communication between the plaintiffs and the defendants that occurred in the year or two before would not be allowed? Well, Your Honor, certainly if Mr. If Mr. Riley wanted to ask the defendants what their relationship was at the time that they, that, that statement was made by their attorney, I, I could understand how that would be reasonable, but I don't think we need to meticulously scrutinize their entire relationship up until the point where, um, you, you know, this event occurred. Um, it's, it, it's, just, it's just simply not relevant to the, to the cause of action. Whether or not they had a good relationship, a bad relationship, whether or not they spoke 10 times or one time uh, is really, frankly, of no moment in terms of whether or not that statement made by their attorney in the context as it was made at the time of those facts, um, that's really what this cause of action is about, not whether or not they had a good relationship or bad relationship leading up to that point. So is that a yes or a no to they would or would not be allowed to inquire into those relationships that existed? We would, we, would, we would say that they could inquire into the relationships as they, as they existed at the time of the statement, but inquiring into all their past and everything like that, we, we would ask the court to preclude that. You can continue with your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, a, a, as I just said, really the, those relationships, the conversations that, that they have, may have had that occurred um, before the, the event with Brian, between Brian Laundry and Gabby Petito and Brian returning home, and really the time period after Gabby Petito's body was discovered, um, really have no bearing on the cause of action. You know, things such as whether or not they saw, ever saw Brian and, and Gabby argue, whether Gabby lived with the laundries and, and, you know, what their relationship was like during that time period, or, or how many times that the, that the laundry spoke with the plaintiffs really ma make no difference in ultimately proving their case. Um, now, th now, the plaintiffs uh, stress in their response that relevance of this information is really of no moment, and really because asking these questions at the depositions and whatever answers they get, wouldn't it be burdensome, oppressive, annoying, or harassing? Now, in, in a couple of the cases cited by the, by the plaintiffs in, the, in, their, in their response, first, HEPCO Data versus HEPCO Medical, which is 301 Southern 3rd at page 410. Um, and, the, and that court said, of course, the scope of discovery must be relevant and the inf information sought must be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. And again, in Kiker versus Lopez, 718 Southern 2nd, at page 959, relevance goes to the issue of whether information requested is discoverable. So certainly, relevance is the first threshold that must be met, and then whether, and then whether or not that information is burdensome, oppressive, and annoying or harassing is ultimately what must be considered. Because in a typical case, irrelevant questions during a deposition, you know, they come and go, they happen all the time, certainly. Um, however, Your Honor, this is, this is far from a typical case. Um, first of all, both families have been through a horrific experience. 
And just speaking for the laundries, they had to experience their son doing something terrible, and then he <laughs> killed himself. Living through that nightmare obviously created a lot of emotional trauma at the time, and it's still, they still carry a lot of emotional baggage as a result. Now, under normal circumstances, asking questions about that event would be very trying. But if you consider in this case that this tragedy occurred under intense media scrutiny, the facts underlying this case probably were the biggest news story in 2021. And, and certainly, you know, due to the COVID pandemic, a lot of people were watching TV during that time, and it was followed on a daily basis by the media. Mr. Lucas, normally I would see if someone is wanting protection for taking a deposition for medical reasons, I usually get a doctor's note of some sort, but I don't have that here. I, I understand, Your Honor, and, and, and certainly we're not, we're not trying to suggest that the laundries have some sort of medical condition or a psychological condition that would prohibit them from answering questions, giving a deposition. It's just that, you know, under, under normal human circumstances, answering questions about these kinds of things are very difficult. Well, you say this is a different type of case, but why should I treat it any differently than any other case that I have? I, I understand, Your Honor. Um, but in, in this case, we do have to expect that eventually these depositions are probably going to make it into the public realm, one way or another. Um, you know, in a typical case, Nobody really pays that close of attention to the depositions. Nobody tries very hard to get them. In this case, it, it's almost assuredly these depositions are going to be are going to be out there at some point. And th this subject is, matter isn't every single deposition that gets filed in Florida on the public record isn't that available to the public at just at a click of a mouse? Yes, Your Honor. Certainly, everyone that gets filed. Yes. Now, we don't know whether these depositions are going to get filed or not and what use is going to be made from them, whether they would be presented at trial, anything like that. Um, but, Your Honor, we're trying to protect the laundries at this point from delving into subject matters that are very difficult, that are embarrassing, um, that are oppressive. Um, just under the circumstances, uh, you know, w the laundries had a film crew parked outside their house for 30 days scrutinizing every time they got the mail, every time they filled their car up with gas. So certainly these depositions are gonna be picked apart um, and it's gonna, you know, there's gonna be a lot of vitriol online toward them. And it, we're really just trying to save them from answering, having to answer questions that are irrelevant, that don't necessarily go to support the cause of action, which is very limited and could subject them to really unnecessary scrutiny, harassment, um, media attention that, that, re that really we just want to prevent them from having to go through again. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court. Good morning, Your Honor. What counsel's asserting is that there should be a prior restraint on our ability to question the laundries in this case. The case is not about the emotional distress that the laundry suffered, far from it. This is about the emotional distress that my clients suffered as a result of their conduct and their statement. In terms of media coverage, they themselves have asked for media coverage. Attorney Stephen Bertolino, who represents them in this case, is in front of the public, in front of the press on a regular basis. So they invite it. That's not a good argument. Um, Same question to you. I mean, why should I even consider whatever the media does or doesn't do? I don't think you should. I'm simply responding to what he says. I don't think that's an issue. I don't think the fact that these questions are difficult for them and might embarrass them and cause them distress matters. That's what litigation is all about. It happens. Parties come into court when they're adversarial. Parties file cases against one another in difficult situations where there's animosity, where there's emotion. This case is no different in that regard than any other case. The, it's, it's a burden that the, the defendants have in this case to show good cause. And I did cite the court, and, and I appreciate that um, Mr. Luca pointed out the HEPCO case because, yes, the HEPCO case says that um, uh, information and depositions has to be relevant, but then the conclusion in that case is, even so, relevancy is not a proper ground for protective relief under Section 1.280C. And it cites two other cases, a D's case, which upheld the circuit's court finding that the information sought to be protected is not related to any pending claim and is not reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence is not sufficient to issue a protective order. 
And then there's the Kiker case that's also cited holding the argument that the information is not relevant to the issues in the lawsuit does not satisfy the moving party's burden to show that producing the requested information would subject him to annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, or undue burden or expense. In all of the cases that were cited by the defendants, except for one, there had already been a request for production or a subpoena that had been proposed or something which specifically identified the information that was being requested so that the opposing party then had an opportunity to say why that information shouldn't be discoverable. In this case, the defendant's not pointing to anything that we asked for at this point. There hasn't been a question posed yet. There's nothing in the deposition notice that says what the areas of inquiry are going to be. It's just with regard to this particular lawsuit. I don't know how the court could fashion an order in this case to limit, uh, as the defendants are suggesting, the questioning in this particular case. Based on what they're saying, I couldn't ask, I couldn't ask their date of birth. I couldn't ask what their address was. I couldn't ask what their educational background was. None of the typical background information that you ask in a deposition would I be permitted to ask. Counsel indicated, except for the relationship between the parties from August 27 until I believe it was September 17 or 7, 19, uh, September 19, I can't go outside of that time period. That's overly restrictive and, and it, it does not address uh, what the rules permit when a protective order is, uh, pr uh, is permitted. There's been no good cause shown in this case uh, to, to entitle the defendants to a protective order because I, I'm not even sure what they're saying we shouldn't do other than go beyond, I think it's a 20-day period, uh, or maybe it's 24-day period. So I don't think they've shown good cause. Uh, uh, if there's issues during the deposition, then we can address that during the deposition. But I don't see how the court uh, can look into a crystal ball or be asked to look into a crystal ball and say, here's the questions that might be asked and you're not permitted to ask them. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and, and I understand, um, as Mr. Riley said, that you know when plaintiffs are in court, they subject themselves to discovery. Um, obviously, we're the defendants here, so we didn't want to be in court. Um, but nonetheless, I, I do think it's important to note that this cause of action is so narrow. It's very narrow. This isn't, this isn't you know, a business dispute about transactions that occurred over a lengthy period of time. It's very specific as to this one statement and what, what the laundries knew, what, what their actions were with regard to issuing that statement. So it, in that context, Your Honor, we don't want to turn this deposition into an expose of the laundry family over the years and what Brian was like growing up, what, you know, what, what their relationship was, with, what, his, what his relationship was with his parents. How, you know, what, what well, get... You can continue. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, so, so, Your Honor, th that's really what we're trying to prevent here. It's just to, to, to establish some guardrails so that, that this doesn't become, uh, you, you know, something other than really what it's intended to be, which is for the plaintiffs to establish facts that relate to their cause of action. You know, th this, this is not a moment for, you know, somebody to create, uh, you know, fodder for online media reports or to make a movie or something like that. That's not really not the purpose of this deposition. It's to uncover facts that are relevant to the cause of action. And in this case, really, facts outside of that, that time period that's, that's defined in the complaint really have no bearing on, 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 on that statement. Nobody contemplated that statement prior to the facts alleged in the complaint. And obviously, anything that occurred after that statement really is not, not important either. Uh, so, uh, you know, with, those, I, with that idea in mind, Your Honor, we would like you to issue an order that confines the questioning to, to facts that relate to that specific time period as identified in the complaint. Thank you. The court has before it the motion for protective order filed on behalf of the laundries at DIN 51. The court's going to go ahead and deny the motion. The court notes that there really has been no showing of any prior misconduct by uh, the plaintiffs. We normally would not um, issue such an order without either some showing of something going on other than the fact that there's a lot of media scrutiny. Um, the proposed limitation in the court's view is overly narrow and would actually preclude directly relevant uh, evidence 
gathering in this particular case under the allegations as alleged. And uh, the court cannot find that there has been a showing of good cause. Therefore, the court will deny the motion, and I'll do the order. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Your, Your Honor, um, and I, I don't know, I, I'll discuss with, with this with Mr. Riley, um, and I don't know if it's necessary, but would Your Honor entertain something like a, uh, having this deposition supervised by a special master or something like that? Um, I've done that only a couple times, and it's usually when the lawyers aren't working along and getting along with each other, and everything I see, the two of you are getting along we, we get famously. along just fine, Your Honor, so I, I really don't think it'll be a problem, um, but I, I just wanted to throw that out there in case if you felt like it was necessary or if Mr. I, Riley and I, I thought I it was necessary. I trust Mr. Luca in your professionalism and in Mr. Riley's professionalism. Yes, there's media here, but at the end of the day, you're both lawyers. You know how to conduct yourselves. You know the rules, and so I trust both of you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything else? No. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick before before you guys get off the record, can I just get the names of the lawyers again one more time? I'll rise for recess. So it's, it's Matt, M-A-T-T-L-U-K-A, for the defendants. And Patrick Riley, R-E-I-L-L-Y, for the plaintiffs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Now, here is J.B. Buno. Judge Hunter W. Carroll rules against the laundry's motion to limit the depositions in the upcoming jury trial filed by Gabby Petito's parents against the parents of Brian Laundrie for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Hey there, folks. J.B. here with you live on WFLA Now. You just heard the Decision by Judge Hunter W. Carroll ruling that the case was not strong enough uh, by the Laundries and their attorney, Matthew Luca, for this motion right here, the defendant's motion for a protective order to limit the scope of the depositions to a certain time frame. That time frame being, again, one more time, I have it here on page number three, August 27th of 2021 and September 19th of 2021. A uh, small but potentially noteworthy victory uh, for Gabby Petito's parents, Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito, the plaintiffs uh, in this case. We will, of course, break it down here with you on WFLA Now and talk about exactly what this means going forward. If you're just finding us here on the live stream, you can use hashtag AJB in the Facebook Live or YouTube Live comment section. And we'll kind of explain exactly what this means. We heard there from Matthew Luca a little bit as to why they felt, why the laundries felt that they wanted these protections in place. And the big thing was, again, seeking to avoid any additional embarrassment or pain as a result of all that they have experienced. The counter argument put forth by Pat Riley, the attorney for Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt, uh, is saying that this isn't about the pain of the laundries. This is this whole the basis of this lawsuit is about the pain of Gabby Petito's parents right there on the right side of your screen from June, Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt. Back to Luca, he says, we're trying to protect the laundries from subject matters that could be embarrassing, oppressive. He noted that, that uh, the depositions would become public online and that it could, of course, lead to vitriol online by the general public and the people that have followed this case with Gabby Petito's disappearance and then, of course, her murder from day one. And uh, another quote here from Matthew Luca, don't want to turn this into an expose into the laundries, but Pat Riley uh, countering by saying, based on the conditions that are read out in this in this motion, any details before August 27th, including general background information, uh, he was in just unable to ask, uh, just to establish some general details about the the people that we have at the center of this, and also to the relationships between them and anything that transpired between August 27th of 2021 so it is from a procedural standpoint a, a a small victory in court for gabby petito's uh parents and for their attorney pat riley um and it could be potentially noteworthy down the road because now when the deposition process takes place 
uh, there's not going to be any limitations on the questions that could ask. You heard there Judge Carroll, and I was ex- I was kind of expecting him to say something of this sort, and he put it, he was very eloquent in the way that he put it. He said, look, I trust both sides. I trust you, Mr. Luca. I trust you, Mr. Riley, uh, to keep the train on the track, so to speak, as far as the deposition process and the questions that are asked over the course of the deposition. Um, this all could be, however, a moot point if the laundries invoke their Fifth Amendment rights to remain silent. But first, let's go live outside the courtroom. This is Matthew Luca speaking live. Okay. Do you want to just go ahead and start with your name and title, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Matt Luca. I'm the attorney for the laundries, the defendants in this case. Could you just spell your last name? L-U-K-A. So I guess, can you talk about, too, I mean, we know that this has been so hard on the Petito family, but for Chris and Roberta, too, you said that this has been a lot for them in the public eye. Yeah, it, it, it was obviously a terrible, terrible thing to happen for both families. And, you know, the Laundries have also lost a son uh, and had to go through that terrible ex- experience as well. So it has been very difficult for them. Uh, and certainly we were hoping that they wouldn't have to relive a lot of those details during a deposition. Your reaction how do you feel? Decision. Yeah, how do you feel with the judge's decision? Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, the judge's decision, obviously, we're disappointed uh, that he didn't rule in our favor. But, you know, we, we have a great judge and he gives a lot of consideration to our arguments. So I, I appreciate the thought he gave to our case. And uh, but and the depositions will go forward. Um, and I know that Mr. Riley and I will work together to make sure that uh, that the questions asked are reasonable and fair. What do you think, uh, Roberta? I mean, how the laundries feel with this decision? What do you think? Well, obviously, I haven't talked to them uh, because we just stepped out of the courtroom uh, and I'm sure they'll they'll be disappointed. But again, you know, they'll be prepared uh, to speak at the depositions and it it really won't uh, affect them, affect them too greatly other than the emotional experience of having to relive those those horrific days. Matthew Luca, the attorney for the laundries. Now, Pat Riley, the attorney for Nicole Schmidt. And Joe Petito. And our camera crews and members of the media moving over a little bit. Can you come up this way so we're not blocking people from going into the courthouse? Thank you. Mr. Riley, can you say your name, please? Yes, Patrick Riley, R E I L L Y. How do you feel knowing that the depositions won't be blocked at all and you can go move forward? Well, I appreciate that what Attorney Luca filed and why he filed it. Um, he's just doing what his clients want him to do. But in my opinion and my client's opinion, this is just another example of the laundries wanting to keep information uh, from getting out to show what their uh, uh, part was in all of this. So we're really pleased with the court's decision today and believe it was the right decision. As the case continues to draw near, it doesn't bring closure, but just having these, I don't want to call it a win, just motions in their favor, how's it making them feel? Based on the text I just received from them, uh, makes them feel pretty good. They're happy that this is the second time that there's been something filed to try to stop us from doing what we're doing, and the court has decided we can't be stopped and won't be stopped from doing what we're doing. And we all look forward this case uh, to this case going to trial and prevailing uh, and showing that uh, what the laundries did was extremely damaging and harmful and hurtful to the Petito family. Do you guys expect the laundries to invoke their Fifth Amendment right? The laundries can't evoke their Fifth Amendment right because they're not crime, they're not charged with a crime. Is that why we saw this motion, basically? I think this motion uh, was intended, as you heard, to keep the uh, the information that was uh, asked of the laundries limited to a very a small period of time. Uh, as I said in the courtroom, this case isn't about whether or not the laundries are going to be embarrassed by the information that comes out. Frankly, that's too bad. Uh, it doesn't compare slightly to the uh, anguish that the Petito family has had in this case. So where do we go from here? Where we go from here is the deposition and see where we go after that. You said that they sent you a text message. What does that text they did. message say? It said, I think it said, us? I, I can read part of it to you. I don't know that I can read Whatever all of it to you, but it says, oh, no, I can't read that part. Okay. Um, uh, they, it said, yes, and great job, thank you. There's more to it, but I'll keep that between us. 
Mr. Riley, there were, um, just to clarify, because I think the public is confused um, that initially that this case was over. Um, there was a settlement earlier this week. Can you expound upon that and their reaction to the settlement? Sure. There were, there, there were two cases filed. The first uh, case, I think, that we filed was this one, uh, the intentional infliction of emotional distress case based upon what Christopher and Roberta Laundry did in uh, making that, that, that really insensitive and, and, and uh, outrageous statement that they made about hoping that the body is found when they knew, in fact, that she was deceased. The second case was the claim that Nicole Schmidt, as personal representative of the estate of uh, Gabby Petito, filed. It was a wrongful death claim in which we were asking for damages against Brian's estate. That's the case which was settled for $3 million. All right. We appreciate All right. your time. Have Thank nice you. Time. Thanks. You too. Attorney Pat Riley, you're live outside the courthouse in Venice, Florida speaking uh, quite clearly, uh, celebrating uh, the decision, of course, by Judge Hunter W. Carroll uh, to deny the motion by the laundries, this motion right here, and by Attorney Matthew Luca to limit the scope uh, of the depositions. And one thing I want to hone in on as well is that any attorney, any attorney for the laundries would have filed a motion similar to this just seeking to protect their clients. That's what of course, attorneys are expected to do. They are expected to protect their clients. So this motion being filed, of course, is very procedural, but also very much expected uh, on behalf of Matthew Luca and really any legal representation from the laundries, um, just trying to uh, ensure that they don't go through any additional hardship, as, of course, any lawyer would. Uh, we're here live on WFLA now. What we are going to do is we're going to end our coverage on Facebook Live and continue the conversation on YouTube Live. We're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, in detail interactively with our YouTube Live commenters. If you're joining us here on the WFLA Facebook page, we hope you'll join us on the WFLA YouTube page where we'll be talking a little bit more about the decision to, again, deny the motion by the laundries to limit the scope of the depositions in the civil lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Judge Hunter W. Carroll ruling against the laundry's motion to limit their depositions in the civil lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents, alleging that they, the laundries, were aware of Gabby's murder and did nothing to help. We're live on WFLA now to talk a little bit more about this. I want to hone in on, on something that Matthew, or excuse me, Pat Riley just spoke about here moments ago in the interview outside of the courthouse. He said that the laundries cannot invoke their Fifth Amendment right. Uh, because this isn't a, they're not facing criminal charges. However, as I understand it, and I want to read here, uh, texting my friend Peter Tragos, of course, the lawyer you know, follow him on, on YouTube, great friend of the program. Uh, I asked him, can you invoke your Fifth Amendment rights in a civil trial deposition process? And he says, yes, you can. And if you do in a civil trial, the jury can draw an adverse inference from your refusal to testify, basically that your silence and your so, you know, your choice to remain silent in, you know, means something and has value of note to the to the jury. Again, this is a jury trial expected to begin in August of 2023. I know the question that's going to get asked immediately in our comment section is when is the deposition going to take place? Well, the deposition, if I remember correctly, um, was scheduled for earlier this month. I believe the date was November 11th. I believe it was. And it was a, yes, it was a November date. And that was supposed to be when 
questions were going to be asked to Chris and Roberta Laundry, who, again, a large part throughout this process, have remained silent over the course of the Gabby Petito story, other than, you know, speaking really through their attorney, Stephen Bertolino, uh, in statements and through the media. So um, the, the depositions are, in a way, highly anticipated because people want to know once and for all, were they aware of Gabby's murder? And if they did, why they chose not to do something, why they chose not to act or speak or cooperate with or cooperate further, I, I should say, rather with law enforcement, because we have heard conflicting statements as to the level of cooperation between the laundries and, of course, law enforcement in September and beyond of last year. So there's uh, so much curiosity to this day as to whether or not Chris and Roberta Laundrie uh, knew something and their reasoning for not doing something more if they did, in fact, know that Gabby had been murdered um, at Brian's hand. So there's a, a lot to break down here. Let's go through some of the comments in the Facebook Live or excuse me, just now YouTube Live comment section. Um, let's let's mention this from Karen Broderick. Hashtag KJB. Will the Petitos ever see any of the three million from the laundries? I know it will go to the Gabby Petito Foundation, but will they get anything? They are expected to get the money that was in the bank accounts belonging to Brian Laundry, which is somewhere in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. Just some money that Brian Laundry had in savings. But let's let's we haven't brought this up on this live stream, so let's remind our audience there was a lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents against Brian Laundry's estate. It was a wrongful death lawsuit. And uh, that was uh, one that was settled uh, in large part out of court by the two sides, by Matthew Luca and by Pat Riley, who you saw here in this case. Um, and so uh, the amount was an arbitrary number, $3 million. But Brian didn't, it, Brian's estate isn't worth anywhere near $3 million. But whatever is in that estate, whatever assets the ha that he has to his name, um, including that twenty to thirty thousand uh, dollars in checking or savings, whatever account that he had, whatever bank accounts he had, that is by court order expected to go from the Laundry family to the Petito and Schmidt families. I just got a text from Stephen Bertolino, and he is the longtime family attorney for the Laundries. Uh, he is not representing, of course, the Laundries uh, down here in the state of Florida. Uh, reason being is because he's pra licensed to practice law in New York, and so they are using uh, and they have hired Matthew Luca to handle the proceedings in the state of Florida. So I asked him uh, the same question that I asked him this morning was, do your clients plan to invoke their Fifth Amendment rights to remain silent uh, for their depositions? His response, they will answer whatever questions they can, and they will invoke all rights and privileges they are entitled to. Again, I'll read that. And this is for our team here at WFLA as well to, again, this will be reflected in our reporting. They will answer whatever questions they can, and they will invoke all rights and privileges uh, they are entitled to, which is basically saying that they are going to comply and answer the questions that they can, and that if there is a question that they want to invoke the rights under the law that they are entitled to as Americans and as citizens and residents of the state of Florida, that would protect them from answering that question, um, they are going to as well. So um, the attorney, uh, Stephen Bertolino, issuing uh, that response here uh, seconds uh, ago. Let's go back to our comment section and try to talk through this a little bit. Um, yeah, again, Tyler's asking, hashtag KGB. I was just going to ask about where good old Bertolino was. Um, uh, Bertolino was on the Zoom call, and I can report as well that Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt were on the Zoom call too. Uh, so, uh, again, court proceedings now, especially since the pandemic, they are happening in large part in person and in Zoom. I, I talked to the I talked to, to uh, Pat Riley yesterday and I said, are you going to just uh, appear you know, by Zoom like everybody else? And he goes, look, uh, it's down the street from me. I'm just going to make it over to the courthouse and make my case and state my case in person. Um, Brandon Hosman, hashtag KJB, hey, why so many lawsuits? Do they expect money out of it? Um, of course, when it comes to civil lawsuits, the primary penalty that we're talking about is in the form of, of capital, is in the form of money. Um, so I don't know if the Petitos and Schmitz uh, expect money, but and they have told me multiple times, this isn't about money. This is about Gabby's legacy. 
and about honoring Gabby's memory and um, doing everything that they can to keep the justice for Gabby movement alive. But uh, there are there look the the twenty to thirty thousand dollars that was um, settled on uh, in the lawsuit against Brian Laundrie's estate. That is a tiny sum when you consider the amount of legal fees and the amount of attorney fees and just how uh, expensive it is legally for them to pursue these these different avenues. Um, so that we can just kind of put that to the side because that's going to be more of a if you're if you're Gabby Petito's parents, that's more of a of a moral victory than a you know than a financial one. But there are two other lawsuits at play here where there could be significant financial compensation pending victory. And that would be the lawsuit against the city of Moab. The city of Moab in their statement has said that they are going to protect, um, uh, of course, their uh, integrity. And what they are going to do is do everything they can to prevail in court. They do not sound like they are going to settle out of court, even though that I'm sure that that still remains a possibility. And then, of course, the lawsuit against the laundries. Um, that is scheduled to take place next year. So two primary cases uh, filed by Gabby Petito's parents as far as the Justice for Gabby movement. The city of Moab, one, as a reminder, is based on right there, uh, that uh, instance when uh, Moab officers responded and chose not to proceed with an arrest or charges uh, against uh, Petito or Laundry uh, when they were uh, the focus of a 911 call uh, that was domestic-related um, back in August of, of last year. And we have covered that extensively here on WFLA Now. Let's go back to some of the questions and comments as we're live here from the WFLA Now Stream Center. Good morning or now. It's about to be good afternoon to wherever you're joining us from. We'll spend another 10, 15 minutes answering your questions here live. Try to make sense of this for you. But this is all uh, the small appetizer before the main course, which is next year, the trial between Gabby Petito's parents and Brian Laundrie's parents, where we might finally get some answers as to really what was going on behind the scenes when the media was parked on the street in Northport, Florida, what was going on with Chris Laundrie, Roberta Laundrie, and Brian Laundrie. Maybe we, you know, one of the questions that too, I would, I'd be very curious, and it does fall within the time range, not that it matters now, but again, I look back now, every time I cover this story, I think back to some of the biggest questions that I still have in my reporter's notebook. And one of the biggest ones that I still have to this day is what the, what the real intention was for that camping trip at Fort DeSoto and whether or not there was um, the biggest question, of course, hanging over that was whether or not uh, Brian Laundrie's parents were aware of the fact that Gabby had been murdered at that point, and two, why are you going on vacation with your son when your future daughter-in-law was just murdered, if you do know that information? That, to me, still, when I look at all the questions that I have to be answered in this case, that is the one that sticks out like a sore thumb because how bizarre it was to have these two be on a very high-profile social media trip across the country and one returns home, the other doesn't, and then you're on vacation about a week or so later. Very bizarre. And so I, as a reporter, want that question answered. Uh, and maybe perhaps it will be asked during the deposition process. Um, let's see. We'll go back to some of the comments here in the Facebook Live comment section. If you use hashtag HJB, they light up uh, in yellow. You can see it here on this screen to my left. Jana says, this is just a theory from Jana. Hashtag AJB. I think the laundry's motion has nothing to do with embarrassment. I believe they are hiding something damaging. And that is uh, the opinion of one of, our, one of our commenters. Sue Mena. Hashtag AJB. Can't this civil trial turn criminal for all the wrong they did? The FBI investigation is closed. Northport police uh, no longer in, in investigating as, as well. Uh, this has, in large part, been put in the rearview mirror from a law enforcement perspective, and it's extraordinarily unlikely that the laundries are going to reveal any information that is going to incriminate them criminally. So uh, this civil trial, because the burden of proof is so much less in a civil trial compared to a criminal one, 
Uh, it might rise. To, let, let's remind our audience, the FBI conducted an extraordinarily thorough investigation, as we understand it, and turned up no evidence of criminal charges possible against the, the laundries. Now, again, acting if and I'm speaking here generally, I'm not speaking here about the laundries in particular and about their conduct and their behavior and their actions and their choices, but I'm speaking in generalities here. You can act immorally and do something that the general public views as the wrong thing to do or the general public views as being immoral, but you're protecting your own self-interest and it's not a criminal matter. It just happens to be perhaps poor optics and uh, poor in the court of public opinion. But in the court of law, it's not necessarily something, of course, that would lead to criminal charges. Um, so that has to be stated. And I know that the public perception of this case is, wow, the laundries should have been charged criminally for, for what they did. But if the FBI conducts an investigation and doesn't find any evidence and doesn't discover any evidence that rises to the level of a criminal offense, they're not going to fire criminal charges. It, charges have to stick in court. Remember that. You file charges, but then you have to convict based on those charges and based on the policy for the law that is in place in that state or in that jurisdiction. So um, Woods 615, I fully expect them to invoke their Fifth Amendment right on any question that requires real answers. Hashtag AJB. I'll read this again for those of you just joining us. Uh, Stephen Bertolino, the family attorney for the Laundries, I asked him, do your clients plan to invoke their Fifth Amendment rights to remain silent for their depositions? And he commented, they will answer whatever questions they can, and they will invoke all rights and privileges they are entitled to. Going back to the comment section. I'm not, I, this isn't really for me to answer. It's more for just to bring it up on stream and perhaps I will give our, our commenters um, the, the opportunity to, to read this and answer this for themselves because this is part of what we do here interactively. This is a very, it's a grim subject because we're talking about suicide, but Lissy is asking, hashtag AJB, do you think that Brian's parents might have been aware that he was potentially suicidal before they left him alone at the campground? I, I don't want to... I don't want to speculate. Uh, I, I can just I can just add that I can only imagine what someone's mental state is like when it comes to at one moment being engaged to spend the rest of your life with this person, and then the other them being dead at your at your hands. Um, we talked at great length in September, October, November of last year what Brian Laundrie's mental state might have been like given what had transpired. And he, again, it would be ruled a suicide down the road um, much later on when, of course, his remains were discovered, collected, examined, and analyzed. But um, again, this, let's see, this is just a comment that I'm bringing up for our fellow commenters. This is uh, really, this is fundamentally at the core of this entire argument and this entire um, why this story persists to this day and why we continue to talk about this story is Barbara's comment. Barbara Nixon asking, hashtag KJB, or saying, uh, of course they knew. Wouldn't you question your son arriving home in their girlfriend's van without the girlfriend? I feel they knew, but the question is, when did they find out? And you heard Matthew Luca mention the date of August 27th of 2021, that being the date that, again, based on the allegations and this narrative that has been put forth through the legal process, that there is this belief that that was when, uh, if the laundries found out, that that would have been the date. Um, really, when Gabby Petito is believed to have been murdered soon thereafter. And it's it's only, it, and it makes sense, right? From, a, from just a, a human nature standpoint, if a... If somebody kills their fiance and you need you are in a state of panic and you need to call somebody who Brian Laundry was a was a well still to me a relatively young person. He's 23 years old. So it's only natural for you to connect dots in your brain to think, okay, he called his parents. Perhaps right after it happened. Um hmm. but I mean we can't assume that. You can't assume that, but that's where 
most people that I talk to in relation to the story and I read thousands of your comments, that's what people really think. It's only natural for you to call your parents after a moment of extreme crisis. No. John Brevard says, hashtag AJB, hey, won't going after the laundries hamper the lawsuit against Moab? Possibly. Possibly take the blame away from Moab. I think that they are considered, this is just me providing my, my expertise as a, as a reporter on, the, on both of these lawsuits. I think that they are treated completely and utterly separate. I do. I, I think that one, it relates to a moment in time, the call, the 911 call that came in in August of last year. And one relates to how the laundries acted um, and how the, what the laundries knew and how they acted in the aftermath of, of Petito's death. I think, I think John, this is, that's just my expertise, just giving you a little bit from my covering of this story and of both lawsuits. I think that they're com considered completely separate. And I don't think that the jury in this case will be given um, any opportunity really to to consider the legal, the legal status of a, of another lawsuit in um, in a completely different state on the other side of the country. Yeah, mystical. I'm wondering this too because I, I have I have heard that I, I, we're hearing. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call Pat later and, and talk to him a little bit more about this. Maybe Pat's watching right now. But Pat, if you if you're watching, you can shoot me a text. Um, he's probably on to his next case. But um, Pat Riley said that they can't invoke their Fifth Amendment rights because it's not a criminal trial. Mystical is asking, can you please give clarification if, if they can plead the Fifth as Petito's lawyer states, they cannot out, out as not a criminal trial. Yeah, I, I'm still a little bit confused by this as well. There's there's appears to be some mixed messages. Uh, one more time, uh, Peter Tragos, friend of the program, the lawyer you know, and, and a an experienced attorney uh, texted me. I asked him that question. He said, I asked him, can you invoke your Fifth Amendment rights in a civil trial? specifically in the deposition process. And he says, yes, you can. And if you do in a civil trial, the jury can draw an adverse inference from your refusal to testify. So uh, I'm, we're hearing some mixed things. And, and Peter is, is sometimes the law can apply differently in certain, there are certain, you know, variations to the law in different states. However, Peter and, 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 uh, and Pat Riley are not just both attorneys in Florida, they're, they're both attorneys in the Tampa Bay area. So we're talking about two attorneys that are right here in, in our neck of the woods. And uh, and we're getting some some different signals as to whether or not they can. Um, the, the laundries can in, can invoke their Fifth Amendment rights to not answer a question. Tank Girl, man, uh, another one. We were talking about the Fort DeSoto camping trip. Tank Girl is um, is certainly on to something here as far as like questions that could be asked tanker wants to know hashtag hey jb does this mean the burn after reading letter will become public record if it, if it is entered into evidence in this case which we widely expect it to be um the burn after reading uh letter um is going to be an object of fascination just like the notebook i mean a piece of evidence the core of this because let, let's let's review um when evidence that was uh, discovered by the by the FBI over the course of their investigation was returned to each respective family, one thing that they had collected that was was very 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 much um, at the forefront of the conversation for a time was the burn after reading letter that uh, again allegedly Roberta Laundry Brian's mom gave to him, and the contents of that letter are still unknown now both attorneys know what's in that letter but the general public doesn't know what's in that letter but a letter that that roberta laundry allegedly wrote to her son brian laundry and then stuck in an envelope and wrote on the envelope burn this is of course um one that has uh, become become an object of fascination um, in the general public with us reporters just trying to get to the bottom of what was in that letter because anytime you have burn this on the envelope, that means that whoever wrote it doesn't want anyone else to find out other than the person, of course, who was supposed to receive that letter. So the burn after reading or burn this after reading, I forget exactly what was on the, the envelope at this moment, but the exact terminology, but is, is very much another section of this or 
um, or focal point of this lawsuit uh, when it takes place uh, next year. And look, we might get this, but even there is a chance we might learn a little bit as to what was in that letter during the deposition process. And the dep let's remind our audience, the deposition process is going to take place way before the trial. So we might not have to wait until the trial itself to figure out what was in that letter if it's asked by Pat Riley over the course of the depositions, um, which, of course, is going to be very, very interesting. Next question. When are the depositions going to be? They were set for November 11th. I, will they take place by the end of this year? It's entirely possible, uh, but I, you would have to expect December or January is when these depositions are, are going to occur. And we will pay very close. You can follow me on Twitter. If Twitter doesn't randomly explode, by the way, uh, you can follow me on Twitter um, and I will tweet out and I'll share it on my other platforms as well. I will share out when the court sets a date for those depositions to be carried out um, in Venice, Florida. But a great, great question from Tank Girl, because that's also in my notes as well. Gold Seekers Adventures, hashtag KJB. If more information is found out from the Laundries family, it can become a criminal case, but it will be opened as a new criminal case due to the information. I, I would I would imagine that that yes, this is technically a possibility, but I don't want anyone to get caught up in this in this uh, the public has this fantasy of seeing the the laundries face criminal charges. And there the the chances Stephen Bertolino has been extraordinarily guarded throughout this process as far as protecting his clients from speaking. And again, based on the statement that he provided to me, Bertolino and, and Luca are not going to allow their, their clients to be given the opportunity to self-incriminate and, and say something that would lead to. Before these depositions even begin, there is going to be lengthy conversations and pre-deposition preparations that are going to take place as to how the laundries answer certain questions and what questions that they seek protections from answering. It is going to be very strategic so that they don't say anything that could be, you know, on the radar of the FBI or on the radar of local law enforcement. So uh, I understand gold seekers that, that there is um, uh, people who want this to go from civil to criminal. I, I get it. But um, the chances of that happening are, so minute it's almost not worth even mentioning at all to tell you the truth and just speaking from from prior cases and prior coverage and um in my experience as a reporter Ange marie hash the kjv will the depositions be live streamed or are they private no they are entirely conducted behind closed doors they will not be they are um they are done as far as it's a it's it's basically it's a requisite pre-trial right or pre-trial uh prerequisite or requisite if you will and so it is not going to be live streamed. These are questions that are just asked to set the stage for the trial uh, next year. Uh, Sunshine State, this is, again, part of the protections thing we're talking about. They need to give up any information they can provide at this point. Tell them everything they need to know. We'll find out if there's anything that they can do to seek protections against certain questions. I can guarantee you. There are going to be certain questions that are asked that the laundries are just not going to want to answer. And whether or not when they over the court, when, when that question is asked, um, you know, it, it'd be very fascinating to be, of course, a fly in the room to, to see what questions they, they clearly are uncomfortable answering. And this is for the, for the majority of the depositions that occur that depositions in in general are not meant to be a comfortable experience. It's it's not pour a glass of wine. And would you, you know would you like an appetizer? It, it, it's very much you're being, you know, put on the spot to answer usually very sensitive questions. So um, there are going to be moments, you know, moments of, of tension in, in that room with certain questions. Some questions are going to be very straightforward, but other questions are there. Look, are, are going to get to some very, I'm sure, touchy subject matter for the laundries and what that looks like. Um, Really, only those in the room during the deposition process will know. But no, it will not be live streamed. It will be conducted behind closed doors.
Yes, and, and Tiffany Pena, hashtag KJB as a North, uh, excuse me, as a New Mexico legal assistant. Yes, you can plead the fifth in a civil suit or a deposition, but if you do so, the judge will tell the jury that they can draw an adverse inference and basically read into their selection uh, and their choice to remain silent. And so that's why, Tiffany, and I'm just speaking to you here directly, that's why I thought it was very, very peculiar that um, that Pat Riley said that they can't invoke their Fifth Amendment rights. So there appears to be a little bit of a, of a disagreement there, but we'll try to get to the bottom of it. Again, I'll try to tweet some stuff out. Um, seeing the comments with hashtag AJB start to, start to thin out a bit. So I will try my very best to, um, to, to, to remind our audience you can use hashtag AJB to ask a question, but we're going to wrap up this live stream in just a few minutes. Um, how hard will it be to find an unbiased jury? The case was and still is huge. I'm in the UK, and it was all over our news. I think it's relatively impossible. I don't think that you're looking for an unbiased jury. I think you're looking for the least biased jury possible. You had to have been living under a rock quite literally to not know about the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie story. Are there people out there that just like are generally aware of it, but at a very much at a surface level and don't know any of the minutia of the actual story itself? I'm sure. I'm sure. But especially here in Florida, finding an, an unbiased jury is going to be like finding a needle in a haystack quite literally. And so I don't think it's really going to be as much as finding an unbiased jury. I think it's going to be finding just as uh, just you don't want. Let's put it this way. Anybody in our comment section right now, you are not qualified to be a juror in this case. I'm just speaking here and uh, just straightforward and uh, as real as I could be. If you're watching this right now and you're that invested in this, you are automatically disqualified for being a juror. What they are going to look for, for as far as jurors is someone who um, has as as just the small as little of exposure as possible to the case altogether, and um, and that's a very difficult task. But that's why jury selection is conducted. So um, yes, all of if anybody was in the comment section raising their hand to be a juror in this case, guess what? It's 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 not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Oh, this is, a, this is an excellent question from Crazy Prepper Linda. Hashtag AJB. Can the Petitos call Cassie, the sister, in as a witness since she spoke with Brian on September 1st and was also there during the Fort DeSoto camping trip? You know, this is a fascinating question. But let's remind our audience, based on, of course, what we're hearing from, from my friend Peter Tragos and from um, our commenter from, from North Mexico a moment ago, or excuse me, New Mexico. I keep saying North because I want to say Northport. Um, Cassie could also invoke her her Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, and and because the case isn't against her and would be, she would be incriminating potentially, um, not incriminating, but she would be you know putting her parents in a bad spot. She would likely invoke her Fifth Amendment rights. I would imagine, um, because the the case isn't against her. She's not mentioned in the. She's not a defendant in a lawsuit. So, is she going to speak and give potentially damaging information uh, as it relates to her parents? Um, hmm. Lil Patty hashtag AJB says that she jumped out of her chair with excitement when Judge Carroll said denied. You know. You know what's interesting is that you just kind of got the feeling. Over the and everyone knows if you watch this with me, you know you you just got a feeling over the the way that Judge Carroll was a, asking those questions to Matthew Luca. You just kind of got a feeling that that's where he was leaning heading into this, um, and, and talking about like is there he asked is there a medical reason why their deposition should be limited? I mean, we're we talking about the fear of a heart attack or something like that. And, uh, and and Matthew Lucas said, no, it's just about limiting further and you know embarrassment and pain and suffering for the family, and you could just get the sense based on uh, on Judge Carroll's um, reactions that he wasn't really buying uh, Mr. Lucas' argument uh, in the motion, and so um, that's how I read into it, and I'm sure other commenters were reading into it in a very similar fashion. That's two for two. Let's, uh, that that has to be that has to be stated. Judge Carroll has had 
opportunities for two decisions in this case so far. The first one was by far the biggest because it was on the motion to dismiss, and he ruled against it and in favor of the Petitos and Schmitz. That's a massive victory. I mean, if he rules to dismiss, then we're not here right now. So that's the biggest victory. This was much smaller, but it's still a victory for Gabby Petito's uh, parents, Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito. It's still a victory for Pat Riley, and it's two for two. And that can't not be stated that uh, so far any attempts by the laundries to seek a legal victory of some kind, big or small, they are over two. Um, let's see, going through a couple more. Uh, I'll look into this, Veronica. Hashtag KJB, do you think the recordings of the depositions will ever be released like they have in other cases? Um, I don't think the rec- I don't know if the recordings will be released, but I am transcripts will be released. But the recordings, I'll have to look into that. I would imagine that probably not. I, would, I think it'll be limited to the transcripts. But I'll check. I will check. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, and again, wait with that same question. You know, Carla, hashtag KGB, do you think the FBI advised them to file the suit to try to get more evidence to file charges? I don't think the FBI is going to advise anyone that is um, within the scope of their, you know, investigation in, in, in that way, Carla. But I would imagine that if you're an FBI investigator and you do not find, you know, if you don't find, you know, evidence of a of a criminal charge being filed and you're an FBI investigator talking to Joe Petito or talking to to Nicole Schmidt about the fact that Gabby was murdered and why they don't have any quote unquote justice for Gabby I would imagine that an FBI agent an FBI investigator could say look it what we have collected doesn't rise to the level of a criminal offense but it could absolutely rise it could could in theory rise to the level of a civil offense based, of course, on the evidence collected. Again, I'm speaking generally here. I'm not speaking based on any, you know, predisposed knowledge that I have in in relation to conversations. I'm talking just generally here that I would imagine that an FBI agent says, look, we don't have, we don't have enough to file charges criminally. There might be something that could be, this could be relegated and downgraded, if you will, to a, it's more of a civil matter than a criminal one. I could I could absolutely envision an FBI agent something saying something to that effect. Whether they did, I have no clue. But I'm just giving you guys some context. Um, Paris Rivers, hashtag KJB, could that open them to liability for costs uh, on the search for Brian? I don't think so. I don't believe so. The cost was millions, millions of dollars. So I, 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 I don't think that this relates to the cost for the search of Brian. This is between the Petitos and Schmitz and this is, and the laundries. It's between these two sides. But let's not, not forget, too, that law enforcement could play a small role or maybe more than a small role in this because they are on the witness list. Law enforcement is expected to be called. They are on the witness list potentially for a trial. Look, it's a very early witness list, and it was just kind of put forth as, as part of the procedure, uh, you know, the pretrial preps, if you will. But we widely expect if this trial does occur as expected next year, law enforcement will be speaking members of the FBI or Northport police, we're going to be hearing from, from them because they're going to get called. That, that, that is widely expected uh, based on, on everything that we have gathered here at WFLA so far. Yeah, he was talking about the wordy Thompson says, hashtag KGB, did you pick up on the fact that the laundry's attorney stated that he did notify the parents about Gabby? Yeah, that, but that was, he was speaking in in the context of an allegation, that the allegation was that. That's how I read into it. And I, I think if you played it back, I think we would all see that as well.
My goodness. Kathy uh, Skiles, hashtag AJB. Can certain people summon, be summoned to court like police have to go to court for a traffic ticket? Can Dog the Bounty Hunter be summoned due to the fact that, uh, that, he, um, that he found the, the, the campsite? I, I would imagine that that, that is, uh, of course, is, that's on the table. Uh, would Dog the Bounty Hunter ever get summoned to court? Not sure. Tyla, hashtag AJB, did the Laundries really think that they had a quiet way out of this? What is the worst end result that could possibly happen? I mean, really, the, the worst end result is um, is some version of self-incrimination. And if not right, right beneath that, the, the, a, massive, a massive financial penalty uh, upon being... Um, upon losing the lawsuit, I mean that that is that is absolutely going to be, um, and also too, I would imagine that that if you're if you're on that side, you're seeking any additional information that would coming that would come out that would make the public view your public view even worse than it already is. Um, if you're the laundries, I would imagine, and just taking a stab at this here, that you are, um, you are trying to move on with the rest of your life and with as much peace as possible. And um, and this trial, of course, brings all of what has transpired over the course of the last, um, you know, the last 14 months right back into public view. So. Um, all right, I'm serious here. We're going to 12:30, and then we got to go. So we'll go back to some of the comments, and we'll we'll say hello. We'll face up with you guys. Hi, good morning, afternoon. Sorry, it is now 12:25. We'll spend another five minutes going through as many of these as possible. D. Hashtag AJB, when Brian left Gabby and had to travel home from their trip for whatever reason, I thought it was strange. You think they may have known he was going to hurt her. I think, so by they, you mean the laundries, and um, this is why the scope of the depositions potentially, look, um, did did the parents know? I can't answer that question. I can't, D, I, that, that, that would be highly speculative of me and irresponsible. Um, it, it, but the Brian's trip home is um, it, it is still something that is. And look, now that this, uh, now that we have um, this ruling by Judge Carroll, that trip home in August, uh, and the and the trip to the storage unit, that's all within now the scope of the depositions. All that 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 that's all reasonably can be asked, and whether it will, is really determined by one person, and that's Pat Riley the attorney that we heard from here earlier on stream, the attorney for Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt. Um, Mrs. or excuse, excuse me, Miss, Miss M. Hilton, hashtag KGB, how come the Petitos don't file a lawsuit against Northport Police? For what? What would the lawsuit be for? The law, if I'm reading into this question, would the lawsuit be because they had Brian Laundry under surveillance and and they they had him in the home and then they lost him? Um, so you would file for negligence. Um, that that's a question for for the Petitos. If if that's what you're asking, M. Hilton, um, that that's a question for them. But it's not surprising to me at all to go after the detectives and the investigators and the law enforcement uh, department that worked so tirelessly to, to bring justice to this case, um, to go after them, you know, that public perception is a, is a very finicky thing. And I, I'm, I'm, I'll just say that I'm not surprised that there hasn't been a lawsuit. And also, too, you file a lawsuit to win a lawsuit. Could would they win that lawsuit filing negligence? Um, that that is a that is a, an extremely extremely uphill battle. Mick hashtag KJB. Do you think the Gabby Petito family? Do you think that they will win the case from with with Utah? I I really don't know. 
I really don't know. Uh, it depends on so many different factors. All the pieces are on the chessboard, and it just matters. What it really comes down to is how those chess pieces move around and um, and who gains the upper hand in court. I can't say. Uh, There's some kind comments from Kathy and Tyla. I really appreciate you guys. Um, thank you for joining us. I think we got another two minutes here. LV, I'll, I'll try to get an answer to that question too because I, I am also curious about that, but I, I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. Um, M0088 with the cat emoji there. Um, might, that might be asked about as well. And yeah, look. Let me let me share um, from as we will we'll wrap up the the comment portion of our live stream. Let me share exactly where this goes from here, and then a note from me personally. Um, so where this goes from here, the depositions are going to be rescheduled now that that that, that Judge Carroll has ruled against the laundries. Uh, to limit the scope of those depositions. The, remember, the depositions were on the calendar, I believe, for November 11th, I believe. Right? What is, what is that? That's a that's a Tuesday, right? Or no, that was a Friday. Maybe it was the 14th. I, I'm not, I'm, I have to check my notes. But a couple weeks ago, it was on the calendar. The depositions were scheduled to occur, and then they were removed from the calendar. Um, and the reason, of course, um, isn't exactly clear, but we know now that there was this challenge to the, zep the depositions in the form of this protective order that was sought by Matthew Luca representing the, the, the laundries to limit the scope of the depositions to a certain time frame and to limit um, any potential embarrassment or pain and suffering on behalf uh, that would be, of course, experienced by their clients, by, uh, by Luca's clients, Chris and Roberta Laundry. So Judge Carroll will, at, at some point, Probably soon, I would imagine in the days ahead, uh, maybe not before Thanksgiving, but in the days ahead, what he will do is he will reschedule the depositions on the calendar. The depositions, um, uh, of course, are going to be um, fascinating, but going to be done, of course, behind closed doors. And so um, that's the next step is awaiting when the depositions get scheduled. The depositions will be carried out. And then it's really it's um, as of as of that point, it's really full steam ahead on trial prep for both sides as they gather everything, all of what they have to to prove their case or defend their case, depending on which side you're on. Everything moves in motion uh, towards August of next year when this massive trial is expected to occur uh, right here in Venice, Florida. Uh, so that's really where things go from here. And I, I, of course, uh, by now, you know, I uh, continue to cover this story. I know that uh, many reporters and journalists, um, they get assigned to different stories and, um, and, and the, uh, the media um, has in large part moved on from this story. I can just share from, from me, I will never do such thing. Uh, until all of our questions are answered, I will always be here to continue to ask questions about this story because of so many people that look to me for exactly that. And I don't want to let you down. So I'm always going to be here covering this story and trying to uh, ask the pressing questions, the right questions, and try to get to the bottom of exactly what transpired in August, September, November of last year when Gabby Petito disappeared, was found dead, and then Brian Laundry disappeared and was found dead. Um, so I will continue to monitor this story and you can follow me on my respective social media platforms for my additional reporting uh, on this story. It's not the only story that I cover. I cover, for those of you who have been with us here before, I, I, I've covered Cassie Carley, I've covered Harmony Montgomery, I've covered Kathleen Moore. There's so many other stories that have that have gone on. I've covered politics. We were live a couple weeks ago for election night. Um, I cover sports. I'm the host, uh, one of the co-hosts for Bucks Bonus, a a weekly show on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I have a lot of assignments and I, I cover a lot of stories, both local to Florida and national. But as a reminder, I will always be asking the tough questions on this story 
and pressing things forward until I go through my reporter's notebook of questions as it pertains to Brian Laundry and Gabby Petito and what really happened in 2021. From a personal note, I will, uh, I will share, I hope all of you, wherever you are watching from, I hope that all of you have a terrific Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, for those of you here in the United States, I know we have a lot of folks joining us internationally. Uh, great, uh, great holiday uh, filled with, of course, turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and football. It's a great, uh, great, great time, of course, uh, to be with your family and with your loved ones. And uh, wherever you're watching from, sending along my very best uh, for, for your, a very happy Thanksgiving. And, of course, uh, for, uh, for the holidays coming up here as well, not too far away. Uh, there's a lot more coming up on WFLA now uh, in the in the weeks and months ahead. We're always adding to our programming, and I'm always here listening to your messages across social media platforms. That's the stories that we need to be covering. That does influence our decisions. So if you message me, you message WFLA, you send an email to WFLA, and you say, hey, we want JB covering this, we want JB looking into that, that does matter. It just has to be prevalent enough and has to be um, – there has to be that the uh, certain quantity for us to really, you know, dig into these stories because we, of course, listen to you. Our, our streaming presence here is interactive because we care about you and we care about what you have to say. So what we will do, of course, is um, continue, uh, as we always do, to monitor the stories that you think that we should be covering here on WFLA Now. We have a whole lot more planned for the for the weeks and months ahead as to what is in store as far as our digital efforts here at W. FLA News Channel. So big thank you to everybody joining us. And one last time and a massive, uh, just a massive thank you to our moderators, including our, our chief moderator, um, Michelle Widener. I'd like to thank uh, Team Brittany, Dina Elizabeth, Lynn GMB, Bug Love. Yeah, we got a lot, of, a lot of our mods in our comment section. Great to see all of you. Happy Thanksgiving to our terrific moderator team. Thank you for keeping our comment section kind, respectful, and helping us promote everything that we do here at WFLA News Channel 8 and at WFLA Now. There's a link in the pinned comment on this live stream. It'll take you over to WFLA.com where we have the latest on this story and all of our stories as it relates to uh, Gabby Petito, Brian Laundrie, and all of Florida's biggest headlines as well. Follow me again on social media, and I will be tweeting out and sharing and posting more about where the trial goes from here, including breaking news as it relates to this particular story. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time on WFLA Now. Happy Thanksgiving, folks.